This is the show called Box Seats. Yeah, this is the show we normally talk about uh, sports with comedians. Uh, I'm Frank. That's Fig. That's T. How you guys doing today? Yes, sir. Good as can be expected, Frank. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. One of them Hold days, it. man. Holding on. on. Yeah, we holding on. Comedy World got rocked, so we here. We here for it. Man. <clears throat> but, you know, this is why if all the people that uh, welcome to Box Seats, first of all, you know, when you lose somebody in the comedy community, uh, shout out to the Arnold family, the, the daughters, the wife, the, the grandfathers, and everybody that to all the living people that's close to Dave Arnold. Shout out to Kim Whitley, who I know was his ace boom coon in this thing called comedy. Uh, but I'm one of those people that happen to believe that you know, we still got to continue to do what we do and, uh, and and push on. We do a great disservice shutting down, so to speak, everything the man stood for. He was one of the funniest dudes I've had the pleasure of working with or even just speaking to. Um, and I'm glad I, I did what I did when that special dropped on Netflix, this last special. I seen it and I, I hit him up and said, dude, you're brilliant. And he said, yo, thanks. Uh, you know, help me get the word out. And I started posting on my page. I did a little text blast for about a thousand people like, yo, uh, you know, I don't watch a lot of specials because they'd be whack to me, but this shit was done perfect. Um, and, and that's the kind of brothers we were. So I, I feel like we are comedians. You know, everybody that comes on this show, how can we not pay homage and dedicate the day to David Arnold? Right. Yeah, man. Um, I echo everything the talent said, man, and, and add on that, um, I, I thought the way that David Arnold approached the game of comedy, man, was uh, it, it was it, 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 you know, it's kind of funny when you when you look at uh, comedy in itself, man, we have different brands of comedy depending on where you come from. Right. New York City is in your face, aggressive, abrasive, um, because that's the way that, you know, that's the way the town is. That's 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 the vibe. And then L.A., has this kind of laid back kind of um I, I don't know like a performance kind of thing and and it it doesn't have that that aggressive approach. David Arnold seemed to um for whatever reason seemed to almost put like a blend of the two kind of genres together. He was sort of aggressive at times and then he had that LA thing at the same time. So he he almost had the best of both worlds. And then um, he not only told jokes, he was a storyteller. And uh, what was true to what, it, what what was nice about what he did, man, is that um, he talked so much about, about him, his life and his family and stuff like that. He wasn't like a joke teller. It, you know, he, he told stories, but he told real life stories and the one thing is that you can admire what he does, but you can't duplicate it because you, you can't duplicate nobody's life. You know what I mean? You can't duplicate the, 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 the stories that he has with his girls and his wife and growing up. and try, You just you can't duplicate that, man. And that's that, you know, I think that in his writing ability is what sort of, uh, yeah. you know, set him apart from from uh, a lot of comedians and, and most. And uh, Let me can, can I say something? Yeah, I absolutely. Something? I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry, Fig. I didn't mean to do that. Um, I didn't want to do the show. I'm not gonna lie. I didn't want to do the show today because uh, at at the end of the day, I was, I I don't want to say I'm close to David because I'm not super close to David. I'm not in his circle like him and Chris Spencer. And all. I'm not like that. But when I when I went out to LA, um, one of the first two people I met, first two comics besides besides Fig, I met Joey Wells. I met Rodney Perry. I met Kevin Hart. Um, I met Enz Mitchell, like all in the same three days, you know what I mean? And David Arnold was one of those dudes who I met and I've been in contact with for years since then, you know what I mean? So last night, finding out how he died, and I'm not going to get into how he died, no, that's not the place and everything, and, and what happened, and all, that's just not the, the forum for that, but I will say that I was very bothered by that because it happened so unexpectedly, you know what I mean? Like, David and I, I gave him his first cover, I get, you know, his women, my wife and his wife, I knew each other well. Um, you know, I remember the first time, actually, Fig just told me, Fig and I were talking 
off the air. Fig, also, let me just put a thing in here and say, Fig just talked to me for an hour and a half, people. He literally got me off the edge. Because <laughs> thank you, Fig, thank you for that. Because I was real angry. I was real upset. I was real. I'm still, I'm still unpacking this, as so to speak. But uh, when I got out to LA, I did my first interview, sit down interview and photo shoot with him. And I was with Fig, and Fig reminded me of that, which was amazing because I didn't even remember who I. I knew I was with somebody. I just didn't remember who it was. And Fig, if you remember, we went and did the photo shoot. And then he got mad. He didn't, well, he didn't get mad. He just didn't like it. He was like, ah. Oh. And then once he saw it in the magazine, you know, the shoot and everything, he's like, oh, oh, okay. That, that, that's you know, what I mean? and 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 actually, that was the second photo shoot I did with him because the first one I did with him, I did a him when my magazine was much smaller. You know, when I was doing the humor mill. But the right. first blowout one I did, I did with him, his wife, his kids at the time were babies. Figure yeah. you know, we went upstairs. We did the photo shoot upstairs in his house. We yeah. Did, it was dope with him and his wife. We went downstairs. We did it in, in his living room. Then we went outside when they were playing. He was trying to direct me. I was like, dude, I know how to do this, but I, I just let him. You know what I think? I just he was driving up the wall. But. You know, you know what the thing is is that as a writer, you know, sometimes, um, well, as comedians, a lot of times we take on the personality of a perfectionist, and you know, he didn't want to put out anything that was less than. Um, you know, that's than his best work. So I, I guess he was he was a little nervous that he didn't put his best foot forward or it wasn't gonna be that great. But I thought it was amazing. You know what I mean? And and you know, it was. It really was a it, when it was we saw the end result, he was very happy. But the problem yeah. was it's like a cook in the kitchen. Like you can see a he didn't understand that when I was doing when I'm doing humor mill. Like I'm getting all the ingredients and stuff to cook. You ain't gonna see what the end result looked like until you see it made. So let me do what I do. I, to, I told him that several times. Dude, let me do what I do. You'll, and then once once he saw it, he, he was happy. You know. Hey, hey, Frank, the greatest movies are made in the editing room. Yeah. The greatest. Yeah. I, I, you, yeah. Know, you, you, you can take all these pieces that, that you've got, all these great scenes. But if you don't know how to put them together as a storyline and, and, and make them blend, you ain't got nothing, man. Yeah. Well, thank you all for watching. I want to thank Trina. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Alfreda. I want to thank, uh, uh, of course, Renee, Amir, people who are cons consistently why I'm sorry, y'all. We ain't putting together the, the show that we normally do. Like, like this show is going to be about David and, and Fig and, and Talent want to talk about sport. Like, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even really watch any sport. I ain't going to lie. See, I, I'm sorry, Talent. Well, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll bounce around and, and, and improv because this, this show is a, the David Arnold edition, and we're just going to go off of that energy, talk a lot more about comedy, but we'll touch on a couple of things, like the big story that we would have talked about and went into is uh, your boy um, Jackson, uh, Lamar, uh, he said he gave the team till Friday. Well, I didn't even, see, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't look at no sports last night or this morning, so you're telling me something I don't even yeah, know. He, he gave the team till Friday to work out this contract, right? But what just that information is not what threw me off. When I heard that, I, I looked at the TV, and what threw me off is they went to a clip of him uh, being questioned, and it was very weird vibe. So the guy goes, "So okay, so Friday, so you guys are talking to you every day. It's like you know, it's just about business, and we're trying to get it done, whatever." He said, "Would you say you guys are close or totally on two different pages, far apart?" And he said, with a straight face, with no expression, nothing. He was like, "I don't know." That that's weird to me. Like, you know, normally people say, "Oh, we're close," or "We are totally on two different pages." He went, "I don't know." Not with a, a sarcastic face, not with a smirk, not with a frown, just a straight blank. I don't know. So I was like, "Damn!" Uh, now I'm gonna be following this for the next uh, 24 hours to see what the hell going on. That's you know Lamar with the, with the Ravens. We all know that he should have been handled this contract. And sometimes we get emotionally attached to our job. Speaking of David Arnold, sometimes we get emotionally attached to our jobs where we do neglect or forget to dot the I's across the T's on the business part. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me, like, again, that reminds me, like, Dave, because in the early years, Dave did a lot of that. So now I would say the second, maybe the, the second half of his stand-up career, Dave got really, really on his business. And you couldn't talk to him if you didn't have your business cap on about doing any business. You couldn't just uh, leisurely bring up business. If you ain't got your eyes crusty, you'd be like, yo, call me, you know, get together, call me. Because Dave sits down 
and he knows A to Z how to do this thing. And, and I can think that's why we were kindred spirits because we worked both sides of the gate, so to speak. You know, we, we worked as great stand-ups, but we produce shows as well. And we know how to, to work a, a door deal or a business deal with any comedy club or venue or promoter or marketer. So we shared that. We were common in that essence. And I, I just think it's bugged out. Here's, here's the irony of some sometimes comedians just reaching out with each other. So I told you about I reached out to him with the special. Last week, maybe 10 days ago, Kim Whitley hits me randomly to thank me for connecting her with Raj G. Now, for the people that don't know, Raj G's female comedian who we lost uh, about 10 days prior to this. So she was like, oh, thank you for connecting us because I lost contact. We was cool as hell. I'm really glad I got to connect with her, man, and speak to her and blah, 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 right? And then literally days after that, the news comes out, we lose Rox. Rox comes to her, her illnesses and stuff. And now, here we are, fast forward about nine, ten days. I'm on the other end reciprocating the call and text to her saying, you know, uh, you just hit me, thanking me, and then Raj passed, and I got to hit you and give you my prayers and condolences and let you know I'm here for you because that's your ace. I mean, like, Dave was the battery in her back to do stand-up. I, I've known her several times where she would dip in and out of it because of the acting thing or whatever case. And Dave's like, nah, you, you have a natural funny thing. So what he did to make her comfortable, he created a whole show called He Said, She Said. Yeah. And they would go and do the show on stage together. The two yeah. of them would sit up, go to a comedy club for a weekend fig and do that tour. He said, she said. Oh, yeah. And when, she, when he's up there with her, she's at her most comfortable. And she is funny. But yeah, she some is. people confidence do like this. And you need that, that battery or that anchor or that kickstand, if you were to lean on. And he was that for her. So they were tight. So I just thought it was ironic how in a swing of two weeks, maybe less, that we did that little ping pong thing right there, the same moving parts, but playing different roles. You yeah, know what but I mean? That he said, she said thing, you hit the nail on the dot with that because they used to do that out at Comedy Union. I used to catch it when I could yeah. catch it, and they were killing that. And I, I used to say to them, and this was back in 2006, I was like, how come this thing ain't even bigger than what it, it should be huge? It really is. Like, I, I don't even know. Oh, Mike Sean's in the building. Mike, how you doing, bro? I'm good. Sorry, my bad, y'all. I was late. My yeah, mom yeah. got me running errands. I'm in the eighth grade again right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand. I get it. But, you know, but that's my mom. Made so. you, hey, Mike, she made you pack your own lunch, and you got to carry your own book bag now. Yep. <laughs> and she said, and, and pick this up and pick that up. And you, you know when your mom says, I'm blessed to have my mom in my life. So I'm like, all right, let me yeah, go grab are. this. And let me put this $30 of gas. She said, put $30 a plus in the car. She said, did you make sure you put plus? I said, mom, I ain't put regular. And I wouldn't even put regular in a lawnmower. Like, I'm not. <laughs> First of all, $30 plus. That's two stop signs you go. That's it. <laughs> that's what I tried to say. Yo, hey, you put $30 in the car nowadays. As soon as you turn it on, you better cut it back off because you're on E. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, I'll see you. In, the gas attendant be yeah. like, I'll see you in a minute. You know what's really funny yeah. about what Tyler was saying about the he said, she said, man, is just that I, I saw that, you know, whole thing kind of unfolding and stuff like that, you know, out there in L.A., you know, because they were doing it while I was out there. We got a, a, a chance at the Comedy Union to perform with Kim and stuff like that, man. And it, she is really funny. Like she, you know, I know they pushed her to do it, man, but she really does. He saw something in her and she does have a gift, man. She, is, she, she, she just like she just got like a natural thing with her, man. You know, she got a funny personality. You talking about Kim Whitley? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. okay. All right. Yeah, let me throw this out there too, which nobody knows is Dave had Damon William Damon Wayans signed to do a pilot about him being a, a nurse. Because if you all don't know, David Arnold was a nurse. He had Damon yeah. Wayans signed to do an ABC pilot that was supposed to go forward in 2009, but I heard recently that it was getting ready to get picked back up to go on Netflix. So I, you know, I was talking to Dave, like I know that's coming. He's like, he said, Frank, that's coming sooner than you than you think. I was like, wow. Well, you know, happy to hear that, dude. You know, and I talked to him about this. This was like five, six months ago. So I'm sure that's one of the other things he was getting ready to, to drop. And do, along with the he said she, because you know 
like Talent said, with the he said, she said thing, he did with Kim, you know that they were getting ready to do that on Netflix. You know that was coming. You know what yeah. I mean? Exactly. Exactly. It was coming because Kim Whitley's now, when the time they were doing that, they weren't as famous. Kim Whitley's now famous. Now he is was definitely getting white hot. You know, now he got 50 City, two, two, two comedy specials, you know, working on sitcoms, writing for Cedric Entertainers, The Neighborhood, you know, that show, neighborhood. you know, he was getting ready to drop that. So I'm just, I'm bothered by that and all the stuff, you know, knowing that I know, he, like Fig said to me this morning, he was literally ascending to superstardom. Like, I just... Yeah, he was he was gonna be amongst those those household names, you know. If, if you know if, if he if he wasn't already, man, because you know more and more people were getting to know about him and stuff like that. And the fact that uh, you know, it was kind of funny. I went to see him the last time he was in Connecticut, man. And um, the funny part about it is when he goes on stage, he's the comedian, and and he's the star. But on social media, he talks so much about his family. And he talks so much about his wife. When he comes to the to the show, people ask for his wife. Like, where's Julie? <laughs> you know what I mean? They ask him for his wife because his social media presence was so strong. And he talked about her so much. They knew her by name. So it was just like, it wasn't just him. He brought his whole family along, which is really like, that is not something that you see a lot that comedians do like comedians you know they have their presence or whatever but they don't always bring their family along with them and and you could tell that a lot of his stories that he did on social media on stage was about his family and stuff like that and yeah. he turned it and made it hilarious and and when i was there to see him you know the women in the audience was like yo where's julie like where's she at where's your wife and, and, and i just thought that that was kind of you know kind of like a, a a different little nuance that he that he had as a part of his career, man. Yeah. He had integrity. Mike, 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 you want to throw something out there about Ju like? Did you know Dave, Mike? Did you, did I you didn't know Dave. I did know him casually, like when him and um Kimberly Whitley did the tour. They came to Dallas, and they yeah. they let me actually get on, and then then we had a conversation. So I don't know him the way Talent Fig Rodney Perry the way you know him. I just knew he was funny as can be. Right and, and was super comp gave me a super compliment after I got off stage, and and he was like, "Wow, that you got a city." He was like, "You got a city. They they love you over here." And I, and, I, and then he went up there and actually destroyed it, obviously. And um <laughs> and and I was like, "Well, now you done took my city, damn it! Like what what you do?" Um, but the funny thing, and this is not funny. Let me use the right words. Life has a funny way of making you forget how precious it really is. Because we always running. We're always yeah. running. We're yeah. always going to the next thing. We're always trying to make the next thing happen. And sometimes we got to fall back and just appreciate a pretty day outside. And sometimes you just got to call certain people and just say, you good? You all right? Everything yeah. good? And just have a conversation. Because we get so busy. This business has us so, so intense to do the next thing. And the fact that... The fact that the man was about to do what he was about to do, God had a different plan. God had a different plan. Absolutely. And and and, and that Instagram post that he put about the Porsche was so brilliant. Yeah. Talking about people are paying more attention to my Porsche than my Netflix, and I don't like that. That shit was so brilliant. And, and what he said, he said, maybe I should have done the show in the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's kind of funny about that now? Now that you say that, I talked to Frank about this stuff. But the funny part about you said that, man, there was a comedian. God bless the dead, man. I remember we went out of town and we did a show, man, a bunch of us comedians, man. And we was with Uncle Jimmy. So we going on stage, man. Everybody's destroying the show. This particular one, Jimmy didn't do so well. He bombed. He went on first. He bombed. Did and it happen in Harrisburg? No, I'm playing. I'm playing. That's a personal joke between me and Sam. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Listen, so he bombed, right? And the funny part about it was we talking about, like, we, you know, after the show was over, we getting on him. Like, yo, man, you, you bombed or whatever. He was like, yo, I opened it up for y'all. He was just like, you opened it up. <laughs> so we get in the car, and we we all get in the car. We going back home, man. We all in the van. You know how we travel, talent, like a group of us. We all traveling. 
Jimmy Mack is destroying the van on the way back. <laughs> like, yo, we crack it up. We in tears. We was like, yo, man, next time you go on stage, you should drive. <laughs> <laughs> You need to take a steering wheel next time you go in the van. The van you. As a matter of fact, you can do it through the sunroof. <laughs> you, need a, yo, you need the van on stage because you bombing your seat. <laughs> Maybe you need a drive up. <laughs> and that's a fun, that's another thing. Speaking of like uh yo, God bless the day. You're right. The Cortezes, the Jimmy Max. Cortez was on that show. And even David Arnold, like these dudes can snap. You know, oh, yeah. Yeah. that was that was a skill that, you know, when I went to L.A., even me and you, Fig, when we had to go record Snaps, the album, let me paint the picture for y'all. They put us in this studio. Now, mind you, to this day, that's why I say monetary Ivy genius. Because on paper, this looks like, <laughs> this looks totally like a, a what do you call it, like an ambush. Like, <laughs> it was me and versus West. But it's only me and Fig. <laughs> we sit in the studio all day for about 15 hours, and they busting these comedians in to beat our ass the whole day. <laughs> like, like how many snaps we got, right? Like, you just, like every time you won a couple of battles, me and Fig dap up. We take a drink of soda. We think we did something. Now here come Guy Tory, Carlos Mencia, and Rick. <laughs> Coolio. Then Coolio, then then Hope Flood, and I'm like, what the hell? Yo, we sat in that joint, two sessions, 15 hours a piece, had to be a total of 30 comics. It's just me and him. Yeah, we're going to make this East versus West. You know, we got more people back East. Face on God. <laughs> we got more people back East. Face I swear. I swear we got more people back East. Guy Tory. Um, who Donald Mencia. Ricky Harris. And, and here's, here's the, funny thing. the funny thing about snapping, and this is why I kind of stopped. I, I got to look at myself like a boxer now, right? Like these hands are licensed, and you shouldn't really be hitting civilians, go to jail. <laughs> That's how I look at my snapping, now, right? Because every time we had a big snap thing, it I always end up not speak. Somebody ends up like not speaking to me for years because <laughs> they lost. They go, you know what I mean? And and half the time, to my credit, Mike, I know you. No, you think I'm a villain in this, but to my credit, half the time, 60%, I do not start. Like, you got to no, do no, something. No, I know you do. I know you, you don't. Do I know you don't. To me yeah. for me to come, right? Because I already know. So I, I don't want to do it. You at, do I saw you at Caroline's on stage and you started on me. No, no, so he I had to do that. that. Um, he had to do that. But that, that was, was friendly. That was friendly. Yeah, that was friendly stuff. I'm talking yeah. about we, we, we talk about we talk about you say something about somebody yeah. being an abortion, and then you don't you don't you don't ever talk to that person again. Like people take that thing seriously. Like I remember being at the Boston Comedy Club when I started at the New York Comedy Club. I went to the Boston. That's why I started. I, I met Fig. I met Talon. I met Will. Rudy Rush and everybody like that. And then I saw this snapping thing going on. And I was like, this is dangerous. I was like, wait a second. Yo. I, said, I went home and started writing snaps. I said, wait a second. This is this this is not a game, right? Here. Yo, you know what's funny, Mike? We used to go on we used to go on road trips and we all got a van and we traveled together as a group. As soon as that sliding door closed, I was game. with y'all. I went with y'all the whole trip. <laughs> the whole trip, dog. I literally wanted to be like this. I wanted to be like, "Will y'all stop? Like, stop it. Let's talk about something else." Nope. You this, no. you that, you this, man. You this know what's man. funny? You know we talk about that, right? Once it closed, you know once it closed. No, once it closed. Serious. Like we didn't, we don't even gotta pull off. As soon as the door closed, <laughs> bam, it stops right there. Before we, before we pull out of the parking spot, Frank. The funny thing about New York City comedy when we started, I was telling Frank earlier, T, how we were married almost because we were like under the black comedy explosion was underground. Nobody really, yeah, we were, we were, none, nobody knew had to have a special night. Yes, and just like um, just like hip hop was underground, comedy was underground. We were sort of like married to that whole thing. It was all like the same. It was all rising at the same time. But right. the funny thing. The rooms in New York were so rough oh. is that if you couldn't snap, you couldn't perform. 
They went in. If you didn't earn the respect of the audience by being able to snap and to handle a, a rough crowd, you couldn't get off no joke. So before Your first you ten even, minutes had to be snapped. Oh, like you, you had literally to had to good people. <laughs> I kid you not. We did an audition at the Uptown Comedy Club for Comedy Central. We had this group of guys that called themselves the Tenant Patrol. They heckled every single comic that hit the stage. And if you couldn't snap back with them, you would get booed off the stage. Man, you had, yo, we went toe to toe for about 15 minutes. I went out there. I couldn't do no jokes. All I could do was snap. Now, that's something I was good at. I snapped with them for about 15 minutes, got a standing ovation. Comedy Central never called because nobody ever got a set off. We hey, listen, let me tell you something. Snapping was so serious. I just started a list. That's just on top of my head. I know it's probably double this people, but these are people that we would go on and they, we, they wouldn't speak to me at the snap battle. Reggie McFadden. Hilarious. <laughs> Reggie couldn't snap. It, yeah, but he started with me. Hilarious. He started with me. I don't know that if you start, okay, like, like say somebody says swing on you, you outside, somebody just randomly swing on you. You don't know they can't fight for real. Like, you got to protect yourself. So he swung on me. <laughs> Reggie McFadden, TK Kirkland, Cheryl Underwood, Eddie Griffin, Hope Flood, Uncle Jimmy Mack, and Tracy Morgan. Yo, you know it's hilarious. Tracy don't talk to you? I mean, we talk now, but we had our thing where it was like a couple of years that went by. Like, matter of fact, you, saw, you see, I just told you about recording that album. When we recorded on the New York, New York. Side, in New York, we started in New York with all New York comedians first. So <laughs> what happened is he was always kind of in a his own competition with me, whatever. But in there, in the studio, Monty and them wasn't getting the good snaps they wanted to get while we were recording. So Monty, being the genius he is, he used reverse psychology. He's like, you know what? Let's, we're going to order some pizza. Everybody take a break. But what they did was they mic the outer room of the, the actual booth where we're going to eat the pizza, knowing that just with us talking and chilling, we were some, it was going to go. It was going to pop. So they're recording us, but we think we haven't eaten pizza. So it's popping, right? And so I go, Tracy, he, talent this, talent this. Talent. All right, well, I start hitting him with a barrage of shit. I see his face change. He's getting serious. So the only thing he got to go is like, well, let me say some serious shit. I get him mad. He's like, well, you don't love your kids. I say, yeah, hey, hey. leave the kids at it. Nah, f that. T don't love his kids. He abandoned his kids. Because he's just talking about me hitting the road, and you know, you know. Now I'm on the road. Tracy ain't. So he's like, you don't love your kids. So he hit me with below the belt. I'm like, bro, we can snap on anything. Well, just leave the kids. Out. Nah, that's that. Nah, 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 nah. He thought because he had a couple of goons with him, he was safe. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that thing? Yo, you was so, You know what's so hilarious about that? That's probably one of the funniest pieces on yeah. the whole album, Talent. You and Tracy going, let me tell you something, man. I on the road, I used to put in when we when we had uh CD players in the car, I right. used to put in a snap CD and ride, and every time it got me to too. that part, man, I was in tears. I'm telling you, man, we was on the road a couple times. I, I damn near wrecked my car laughing at that uh snap cd man it was done by atlantic records it was right. called snaps and and like talent said we were the only ones out me and talent flew out to la and we battled all of the la comedians ourselves man it was it was hilarious man so tell me, how, how that thing how did how did it unfold after you after you choked about how it unfold like did you, well you know, when they got so, so this is my second this is my second choke at this time right so, he, he got he got two chokes. He does have two chokes. I got I have three under the belt. This was the second one because I I choked Franz twice, right? So what happens is my chokes. My hands got those, I got those big basketball hands. So you really literally got to people grown men got to peel these out, right? So they peel them loose, and they're like, "All right, that's it for the day." You know, uh, Tracy, you get out of here. So they held me back and kept me there. I had to wait like a half hour while Tracy left to make sure he cleared up the body and go start then outside, whatever, what I understand. And fast forward a week or two, I'm doing Rob Stapleton's room, the Sugar Shack, on a Thursday. 
So I'm on stage, yo. And it got to be about nine, 10 minutes. It's supposed to be about 20, 15, 20. I'm up there about nine, 10 minutes. And it's going great. I'm, I mean, the biggest laughs. I'm like, it's, it's one of those moments. You're so young in the game. You're so green. You're like, yo, I'm, I'm funny. And for you're like, you're happy. You're funny. And out of nowhere, soon as one of the laughs died down, which was, you know, it was weird because how you ripping a room and as soon as the laugh died down, you can hear somebody yell out something like, you corny. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And so I'm like, they must not be talking to me. Somebody's randomly yelling. Shut the fuck up. I was like, what? I see yo. And it, it just hit me. And I'm like, I know the voice. I said, I, okay, I know, I know that. I see yo. I immediately took me all the way out of my comedy character. I said to them in the microphone, and it's only 10 minutes. So I feel bad. I know he's probably going to pay me now. Right? I'm like, I said, listen, I just want to apologize to the audience, man. Uh, I can't finish right now. You know, some bitch ass is yelling out of the back. I don't play them games. You know, enjoy the rest of the show. And I do this. So to walk out, you got to come off the stage and go this way to the door out to the bar area. So as I'm walking on that wall, it's Tracy and about four or five of his goons just posted. They ain't sitting down. They stand against the wall like so as soon as I'm walking by, I just start talking smack to them. I'm walking by. See, I knew it was your bitch ass. I'll be right out here at the bar. And I go sit at the bar waiting on him. And Rob brings the next person up, come out there like, yo, man, you know, ain't nothing popping off in here, man. Blah, blah, blah. Y'all need to you know, squash that shake hand. I said, I'm not squash. I didn't do anything, bro. I did what you told me to do. I went up. I was doing my time. He yelling from the back. Great set. You need to talk to him. So this went on for like two years. We just wasn't speaking. Then one day, I walk in Mike's favorite strip club. <laughs> Sue's rendezvous. rendezvous. <laughs> I walk in Sue's rendezvous. Oh, boy. You know, it's four blocks from my house. So hey, I said that, that night, I think it was me and somebody else. One of the comics were coming from the Boston or something. Let's go get a drink, look at some ass. We go inside. Soon as I walk in, because security knows me, he goes, Yo, your man, oh shoot, talent here. Yo, your man here too. And I'm like, you know when people say that in the hood, it could be anybody. I'm like, yeah. my man, who? He's like, Tracy Morgan, right there. And, and I put his hand out. I said, no, 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 I'm pointing over there, right? So I say to my dude, I said, he's, oh, oh yeah, Trey, let's go. I said, no, no, let's walk this way, the opposite side. I, they don't know I got beef with that. I'm just like, he's a spectacle, you know, whenever you see him. So Trey sees me, yo. <laughs> now, first of all, you know he, you know, you know he's autistic because he got a big bottle of white Zivendale. <laughs> Like, who gets bottles of Zippendale in the champagne thing? Trace. So he's like, this. man, let's break bread, man. We need to stop this bullshit, me and you, man. Da, da, da. Man, we two, we two funniest dudes in New York. Da, da, da. And I'm just looking at him like, okay, this is his form of apology. I was like, yeah, you're right, bro. I mean, I was already over it, but I was like, yeah, you're right. And just that quick, it was squash, right? And you think you're having a good night. And two hours later, they're about to beat Tracy up, throw him out the strip. Every time. So now the guy that just made up with him, who he had beef with for two years, had to save his ass from getting beat up because it was my town. I know all the dudes. Security was going with one of the strippers. He's trying to manhandle the stripper and force it or whatever. And it was about to be ugly. He's in there and force it to whatever. <laughs> no, because, okay, let me, I, I ain't going to want to go into detail. But no, don't elaborate. Tracy, don't don't have elaborate. Tracy, Tracy was spending money, right? Yeah. And I've seen this all the time with celebrities, especially or, or doughboys. When they spend a, a, a shitload of money in a strip club, they expect more. Yeah. Or they they you know what I mean? They think you the you the person. I didn't I didn't tip you. He tipped about three, a little over three grand, right? That night. So when the lights come on and they last call and we about to close down, she she comes though making her rounds, thanking everybody who tipped her, which is polite in the strip world. They spoke that's good. Right. So she gets to Tracy and goes, thank you so much. Brother. And went to walk off and he grabbed that arm. Like, hold up. Oh, boy. And she's like, what? I said, thank you very much. No, yo, yo what, so what's up, though? She's like, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. It was a great night. I appreciate you tipping all the money. He was like, ah, yo, I tip, I tip like three grand. Yo. Yo, something got to pop, boom, boom. So she yanks off and goes to the back. Lo and behold, five minutes later, Tracy's like, man, you bitch, man, let's get out of here. Mary Lee had come the biggest one they got. They got some big security, but this is the biggest one they got. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is never good. This, this shit here was like a little. <laughs> had to turn around. He said, yo, he had the girl. He was so big, you didn't see the girl. He just seen the big dude. 
town on Trace said, yo, you, you everything good? You disrespectful? He's like, nah, what do you mean? Then he pulled a girl from behind and said, you disrespect my girl? Trace said, oh, no, nah, no, nah, love is good. I was tipping all night. Yeah, but she just said you disrespect her. You grab the arm and what, what you insinuate? And Trace like, oh, no, nah, you know, it's misunderstanding. There ain't no misunderstanding. My name. He said, yo, make it right. Right, so Tracy said, make this it is right. funny to me. He said, make it right. Tracy said, like this. He said, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I apologize. <laughs> but that wasn't enough to do. Said, no, nigga. Make it right. <laughs> oh. I said, oh, oh. they won. Oh. What? Oh. Let the extortion begin. I said, I had that. So, yo, let me holler real quick. You know, he's like, no, I remember. I was like, yo, this is you, so. So, yo, T, man, I said, yeah, man, you know, but, you know, he, he had the influence. You know, I, I had to say what I had to say to get him out of there. I, I never told Tracy, but I told him he smoked the crack. So, <laughs> I never had a chance to tell Tracy this. I never thought it was important. The important thing was getting his ass out of there because I know how Mount Vernon get down. You know what I mean? And it wouldn't have been, it would have just went from one level to the next to the next. But that was, that was the Tracy Morgan thing. You know what I mean? But now. I can't shut him up. I try. I try not to see him. If I see him, I don't have that kind of time on my hands. That I went to a Nick game. He was sitting one chair in front of me. Asked me about that Nick game. I don't know who did what that whole game. <laughs> so, <laughs> the white people were so mad on the floor because the white people, he, you know, Tracy on the floor. I'm one seat behind the floor. So the whole time he got his kids and everything. The whole time he turned. To me and Kenny Williams the whole time, yo, so what y'all niggas been up to, man? How's your mother, your mother devil? So the wife is on the floor like, can we watch the game? Like, and Tracy will turn around for one second, like, yeah. So listen, man, what y'all doing after this shit? Like, this, I was like, this nigga watch the uh, game? Hold up. I don't want to pile on because I got love for Tracy Morgan. I don't want to pile on. We did April Fool's comedy show. Right. I did, and, I, and I did really well. Taylor was on it. I forget who was the actual headliner. I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't. Me. I don't think DL hosted it, but what whatever it was, we ripped. Like everybody right. ripped. So once again, I'm like, all right, I fall for the Tracy. Yo, we going to the club, and I'm like, I, I would like to hang out with Tracy Morgan. I said, I, I think I think that would be nice. <laughs> Put it on your hangout resume. Yeah, I was like, I think that would be nice. And, and my best friend Jay Black was with me, so we're like, you know, my whole family came. They saw me do my thing. I was like, I was in a good mood. We went to the club. So it was the exact same thing. I didn't know he was gonna take his shirt off. So I'm standing next to the dude, like, like we hanging out. He takes the shirt off, puts it in his pocket, and grabs the chick by the arm. Now talent saved him. I left. <laughs> like what? <laughs> I was like, I'm good because. This seems like I'm about to be a part of something that I'm going to be a witness to, and they're going to ask me questions on a stand. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm out of here. But the other thing about the Boston, about snapping and all that other stuff, the craziest thing is that, so I watched all y'all do y'all thing. So then right. I, I start becoming ruthless. Like, I was like, all right, we're going to be ruthless? I get it. I got to be ruthless. <laughs> I said, this is what we're going to do. Right? And I wasn't even drinking at the time. The craziest thing is when you do a white comedy club and you don't have to be ruthless. Oh, and you go yeah. up there and all of a sudden they look at you and they're like, you're okay. You can take your time. You know that, right? Because in New York, you had to have like jokes just, just fire off. Like it, it had to be like, pat, 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 pat. I was here. I was there. Barbecue, ribs, all this other stuff. You had to just go, 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 go. When I went to a white comedy club and they, they basically <laughs> told me, they gave me the Roddy Perry. They said, relax. Just tell your story. And I was right. like, I don't ever think I'm going back to black clubs ever again. But <laughs> <laughs> well, Yo, you know what a black it? club is, Mike? I, a I black see. club is like, uh, in hindsight, it's like growing up black, we got ass whoopings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And believe it or not, if somebody told you when you was a kid, you would learn, you would come to appreciate these ass whoopings, you think they're crazy. Yeah. But that's what the black urban yep. circuit did for comedy comics. Yep. Yep. It got you tough. So when you look back, because sometimes even though now we 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 doing what I call we're sitting pretty, right? From where we come from, we're sitting way pretty. So every now and then we still get thrown in an awkward position or offbeat situation where that comes back to help us 
win in that situation. Yeah. Because if we didn't have that, get those ass whoopings. Uh -huh. I'm all them ass whoopings like our parents did. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be strong enough to survive in these these awkward moments that still come every blue moon. Every blue moon, you're going to be in a situation like, oh, mm, really? Like, uh, okay, uh, yeah. damn, I'm going to make this work. And then all that comes back. Like, oh, yeah, yeah I remember that time the mic went out at the Boston. Or oh, I remember that time the power was out in the lights and I had to broadcast through my voice and be more active and go into the crowd. All that stuff comes back and you apply it to get our said situations. Yeah, and, I remember and, that and, and, Yo, and I remember let me just say, huh? No, no, let me just say this one thing about Fig, and I said this story before. Fig saved one of the shows that I did in Camden, New Jersey, and a certain comedian bombed thoroughly. Not because it's not funny. He just, it happens. Like, sometimes there's a night where it just, the crowd ain't messing with you. And I was sitting there, and mind you, if you host this, if you host something once a month, and you've done it for like two or three years, they damn you don't heard all your jokes. Like yeah. everything you're doing is freestyling at this point. Like they damn near, and I was sitting there going like, they don't heard all my jokes, and all Fig said was just put me on. <laughs> That's all he said. That's all he said. He said just put me on, just like that. Like it was almost like he should have said pause, but we ain't say it back in the day. He was like, "Just put me on, Mike," and I was like, "You you caught the good thing." Yeah, and I was my, like, "With my luck, I'd be like, Fig, you gonna go on?" Nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, you know what's funny? Tell me, coming up in Uptown, doing um um the Boston traffic, all that stuff like that, man. It prepared you, like you said, man. Them ass whippers prepared you. But when you went on the road and hit one of them clubs, I remember uh, me and Hamburger on tour. We doing clubs. I'm doing 30 minutes. Hamburger doing 45 minutes to an hour. Shut down. Hamburger, I was on tour with Hamburger doing the creative tour. Remember the creative tour back in the I day? I remember the creative tour. Yep. I was on the tour with Hamburger. I was his opening that Hamburger got a standing ovation at every, every show he did. So we get to At Atlanta. And guess what club we doing in Atlanta? Five, five, nine. Cool. Five, five, nine. Man, this club, <laughs> this is like, it's like a strip club where everybody's dressed. <laughs> it was wild. So we at the club, man. Bruce Bruce is just up there. He's talking to the crowd, whatever, man. Everybody leather suited, pimp hole, and everybody everywhere. It was <laughs> Bruce Bruce put out about five new jacks. Everybody ate it. Yeah. Wow. Ooh, they, they was bombing. He was throwing them off the stage, bring it up the next one. It was crazy. He said, All right, listen, y'all, we got to the uh, you know, we get to the pay acts now where we're about to bring these dudes on. Bruce Bruce bring me on stage, and he just whispers in my ear, just just do whatever you can. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, but he told everybody that, bro. That place was so rough. He knew, like, I, I to this day, I, I think that the only explanation that makes sense of this room, because nobody, I mean, you, you, you was lucky you got your 10 minutes off, whatever, but it was really a catastrophe. So the only thing that makes sense is, like, the owner or promoter loved Bruce. And, you know, Bruce was the guy at the comedy club, and he wanted some of his club. So just, just to have Bruce there host it, it that gives us a hard. night. People gonna come out, and support, and boom. Because it did. No other thing makes sense other than that. It was a, it was a thing for Bruce. He was a big fan of Bruce. Uh, speaking of comedy, all the people that might be jumping in late and saying, "What the hell are they talking about?" Today's show is dedicated, and we're honoring another fallen soldier, David Arnold. David A. Arnold, comedian extraordinaire. In case you didn't know, born out of Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, sir. March fifteenth, nineteen sixty-eight, passed away uh, last night. Uh, September 7th, 2022, uh, he was uh, living in Los Angeles for the past years, and his comedy stinks from 97 all the way to up until yesterday when he, he left us, but his comedy will live on, obviously, because he got stuff in the can. Uh, he's on Netflix with specials. More importantly, he's a writer, producer, director, what we call a showrunner in this business yeah. uh, for Nickelodeon and other networks as well, and we know he had a lot of stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, survived by his two daughters and Julie uh, Harkness. Uh, our, our condolences definitely go out to the two little young queens coming up and his queen uh, that he left, Julie. 
like you said, like Fake said, everybody know Julie if they don't know Julie. You know what I mean? Right. If you it's watch that did. last special, that's part that's part of what captured my heart. I mean, automatically the comedy is immaculate beginning to end, right? The way you put it together, I was just super impressed. That's what you want a special to be. Because I start losing interest in these hour specials. To me, I thought the best formula was the 30 minute special. It was more yeah. powerful and potent and it did more yeah. for people. But he somehow was the exception to that rule with his special, this last one. And then and you don't move from the TV, and he goes into the the father, you know, the, the that raised him because he had a biological father, and the father raised him. He goes into talking to him, giving him his flowers right now, and it goes. He even when he says goodnight, the special, he pulls out the wife and the daughters, yeah. and closes up with the family, like the, yeah. they're like the, the fucking Obamas. And he's in the house talking to the daughters, talking to the wife and all that. I say all that to say the man was a shining example from the beginning to the very end. He was calculated with it, man. He was he was calculated how he put the whole thing together, man. And yeah, I really, man. You know, one, of, one of the things that struck me as amazing is when he did the, uh, the story about his grandfather. I spoke to uh, one of our comrades that's not on today, uh, Rodney Perry. I spoke to him last night. Rodney Perry happened to be there at the taping, you know, um, and, and was a part of the whole thing. And I, I, I saw a part anywhere where he was uh, talking about about his grandfather. He kind of he kind of lost it, need to take a break. You know what I mean? I saw that point, you know, because you, you never know what how people impact your life. You know what I mean? When you're young and as you get older, you start to remember uh what it is that you those those lessons and and mm -hmm. those stories and those moments in your life where uh certain people certain men certain women in your life give you certain life lessons yeah. carry you the rest of your life sometimes you don't even know it until like you said Tom, until you hit that point in life where you need it and you use yep. it and then you reflect back on where you got the ability to be able to do that and ability a lot of the stuff that he got was from his grandfather and, and the men in his life, like his biological father, his stepfather, and then his grandfather. When he talked about that, man, you could tell that he was really moved. You know, he yeah. mimicked him and everything, man. I thought that was that was amazing. You don't really see that in a stand-up special, you know, because he, he, he took like he almost did like a a little piece of like a one-man show, almost yeah. like it was a play, and then he went back into the stand-up. Let me just throw this out there too, and, and give kudos to to uh, Kuki Wigginton, who allowed David Arnold to be the host of Chocolate Sundays for many Sundays. And uh, uh, like when I was going out to L, when I was in L.A. and I would go out there from like around 2008, 2009, David Arnold was the host. And you know, usually when you see a host, you know they always are repeating jokes. You know what I mean? I've seen I've seen certain hosts like Chris Spencer, David Arnold, Tony Rock, Talent. Um, those are the four guys that come off to me that they don't repeat the same jokes when they host. You know what I mean? And I, you, Talon, I'm giving you flowers now, um, along with Tony Rock, uh, along with David Arnold and Chris Spencer. It's amazing to me when you host a show and you know some of the same people will come, like me. Like I was there last Sunday, I'm going to be there next Sunday, and the Sunday after that, or the show after that, whatever day falls in, and I get disappointed when I hear you repeat the same jokes. It's amazing to me that you're able to host at a, at a top level and not repeat the same jokes and how you come able to pull David had that to it. Like David was brilliant to that. And I just recently learned that that talent is brilliant. Like I knew talent was brilliant anyway, but I didn't realize, I, see, I didn't realize how good a level you were at with this hosting thing and, until recently. And, and But David Arnold was at it. Like Tony Rock, David Arnold, Chris Spencer, gee, you guys, I don't know how you do it. Like I, when Fig and I were talking just now before we got, Fig had me on the phone for about an hour, hour and a half. I don't know how you all were able to do that. So I want to give but, you. But all you know, it's, it's a mathematic equation. I'm sorry, Mike. It's a mathematic equation where I never understood how people start a rumor or host a weekly thing, right? And they're begging the people, "Hey, can you come back next week? Are you come back next week?" And they, you, we, because that's what we do. We get you in there, and then we're begging you because we want an audience. And we want a room to be successful. And that's cool, but do the math. If the people listen to you and they do come back next week, you can't keep giving them the same show. Who's going to keep going? Bruh, I love the movies. I'm not going to the movies the same movie three, four times. I'm sorry. 
All right, maybe Black Panther, maybe Black Panther. Well, maybe, maybe Black Panther. Maybe Black Panther. Right. But, 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 but let me just say this about Talent Fig and, and co the comedians that you mentioned. What The one thing I learned about hosting a room that you're going to host weekly is that you got to pay attention to the stuff that you say to the crowd. Because when you, Talent can recall, he can say something about this person and then 15 minutes later bring that joke back. Yeah. So while you on stage, you have to pay attention to what you saying to them and what they're saying back to you, because that could lead into a huge explosion because yeah. everybody's going like, oh, shit, that's right. He is an accountant. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He is. Yeah. And, but but the whole the whole problem is you got to keep thinking in your mind, like when you say that is a trained Yo, it's but a it's, it's thing. but it's a knack. It's it's a it's a real 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 talent to host versus just being a comic and doing a set. Like I don't care what nobody. Just don't drink. Just, just don't yeah, drink too man. much. Just don't drink too much. Just don't drink too much. Let me just tell you this, man. You know what's funny? A bit. You know what's funny? Uh, here's the thing about the meeting. It's two <laughs> sides to the coin. Sometimes you do a, a set and then you flip it at another time. You do a set. And you have people that was there that saw you before that brought somebody back with them because they wanted to hear you tell a certain joke that you tell and you didn't do it. When you come off stage, they'd be like, yo, I brought my boy because I wanted you to do, I wanted him to hear this particular joke that you did. Now flip that, go to a concert and have somebody that you went to the concert do all new material. You're like, yo, yo. Where the hits? You know what I mean? They like I I can I went to see Luther and you didn't sing a house without a home. You did some new stuff. I wanted the new stuff. You never know what the audience wants. Sometimes they want you to do the stuff that they heard you do. Sometimes they want you to do new stuff. That's for comedians. But you go to a concert, they better do the song that you heard on the radio because if they don't, you piss. You're like, wait a minute. I came to this concert. But you so gotta, but do this you stuff. have to be the smart. You, you, you're, you're the professional, Fig. That's what you got to do. It, it's going to sound crazy, but when it comes to that, what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, you're the joker. So you have to trump every other card. All the people are the cards, right? There's no such thing as a professional audience. You're the only constant professional in there is the guy on stage. Right. So you have to trump what you think they want. You, a, there's two ways you can go about it. You can figure a way to blend it, or you can just trump it and trump it and beat it with funny. Because yeah. at the end of the day, even if they yeah. came and wanted to see ABC, but you didn't do it, but DEF was funny as fuck, yeah. they go, yeah. they'll leave with that, right? And yeah. I always choose that because that equals growth. If I keep sticking to the same script because people say they want to hear it, I stunt my growth. I oh, go through absolutely. that every dude. I go through that not a not a. I can't get through four or five shows without somebody going, "Yo, you didn't say it's just comedy." Yeah. I'm like, bro, because I don't sometimes, motherfucker. I'm, I'm doing other. Shit. No, because I was kind of mad. I was kind of mad because talent never says whose dog is this anymore. He, he never, he never, he never, he never does that. You know why? He you know why, Mike? Let me tell you why. Because I ain't nobody's dog. Because I, I ain't nobody's dog. Frank, in this show, bro. In this show. All right, so we roll everybody in. Well, hold on, but one more thing. One more thing. If a dude ever says he brought another dude to see me at a comedy show, like Fig just said, I don't ever want to see you again. Don't yeah. ever come to him. Yo, I brought my dude because I wanted my dude. Yo, hold on, before you end, yo. <laughs> playing, let I'm me playing. tell you how dope it was back in the day. We be snapping and destroying. Dudes would bring other funny dudes in to see if they can beat you snapping on stage. And they would Bruh. come in just so they could heckle you to see if you could beat them. Hey, you know, that's I not a lie. Did day. I ever tell you this story? They scared me to death in a mall. I'm somewhere in middle America in a mall. And I'm walking this mall. And I really wasn't there to buy nothing but food, right? You know, I'm leaving the food court. But, you know, I see what kind of stories you got. You look at. And I noticed out my periphery, it's like five, six young dudes following me. So I'm playing it off. I stop at the window, see if they go by. They stop. About 10 feet that way. I'm like, I'll go a little bit. I'll stop. They stop. I'm like, yo. These things about to rob me, right? So I dip into a footlock. 
they sit out on the bench in the mall outside the food line. So I'm in this joint taking mad time. First of all, I don't even want no sneakers. But <laughs> I, I'm trying to stall, like, go away. These things, I'm like, damn, I'm trying to figure it out. It's like women working and stuff. Can anybody help me? I'm like, you know what? So let me let me get these in a size 12, or whatever. I'll buy a pair of sneakers, bro. This is how much time I'm taking. I really buy a pair of sneakers. And I'm sizing everybody up out there. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to hit this one first and, and kick this one. And if I run to the right, there's an exit. I, I'm working it out. Come out, I got the Foot Locker bag. I'm, I'm buffing up as much as I can, like ready for embrace for the whatever. <laughs> and the one dude said, go get him, yo. And I'm like, and he's like, hit him. You, you, oh, now he's right here. You don't want to get him? So I'm like, the oh, fuck? And he go, nah, he talking about he could snap better than you. He'll take you out right now. <laughs> they got my whole blood pressure. Everything that everything I love went back into place. Like, I said, oh, y'all want to snap? Like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I still ran out the mall. So hold up. Just so everybody knows real. After the show, I'm going to go on my Instagram live for a little while, pay a little more homage to Dave and welcome people in to talk about him. Uh, just do a little after show. I know Amir Silly's going to pop in, and you guys are more than welcome to pop in. But uh, you can find me a Talent Duck Comedian with a DA, Talent Duck Comedian on Instagram. I hope to see you on there live in about five, ten minutes. At Mike Sean Comedy, y'all. All prayer prayers to the family. Prayers to all my comedian friends who I hate seeing feel so bad. So that's it. Yeah, man, you you see it right here is that comedian fig, and my prayers go out to um uh all all David Arnold uh family, especially the immediate family with the um his wife, the girls, right, right. and um you know friends alike. Man, uh, my <laughs> condolences, sincere, deepest. Heartfelt condolences to the Arnold family and everybody that are, you know, are, are feeling the pain of, of this tragic loss so suddenly. And, and, and one more thing, this might be inappropriate, but I, I'm going to say this. These guys really loved him. Roddy Perry really loved him. Please, y'all who really didn't know him, don't use this for views and likes. And don't try and, and get and get your views up and your likes up because that's not what it's about. These cats really love this person. So if you didn't know him and because I knew him casually, that's why I haven't posted anything because I think right. it's disrespectful to right. the people who really spent time with him. So please don't use this as an opportunity to try and get a few more likes, a few more views or or, or do whatever, because Instagram is famous for that nonsense. It, especially. If all he did was take a picture with you after the show, that don't mean that you knew him. Just because you in a photograph with him don't mean that y'all were friends and that he knew you and stuff like that. Like all of us comedians, we take pictures with people after shows and we don't know them from a can of paint. It's just a love thing that we do. I'll say this. I'll say this in closing. Um, his closest people didn't post anything last night because they were all asked not to. You know what I mean? Me too, yeah. Yeah, yeah and... and and I, I was asked literally not to post a story, nothing to the rest of his family and my his closest friends knew. I got upset last night because people were posting as they heard. And honestly, it seems like people were racing to post stuff. I get all yeah. that. You want to do that. And they, but sometimes you got to wait till the rest of the family knows because he had extent like David is from Cleveland. He had people who were in different time zones. They were trying to let everybody else know instead of finding out. Yeah, you know, even I want to give kudos to 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 dead deadline. They didn't post nothing to five hours later, and they knew they knew 15 minutes after it happened. They didn't post nothing right. to five hours later. So Mike, absolutely right with that. But we can maybe roll up out of here. Wait, wait, Guys, Frank, before you roll out, please let me just say this. This is a sports show. We love David Arnold. We are comedians, a sports show. Tonight is the kickoff of the NFL season, and we'd be remiss. Talking about boxies, if we didn't at least say that. So all of your sports fans will probably be talking about the game tomorrow. Yeah. Don't forget, tonight is the first night of the NFL season. And, and Talon already bet $10,000 on the bills. Like, hey, look, it, look. It, it don't even make no sense. Since, make this, no since sense. this ain't a show we shopping, hey, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you you ain't like it, Talon. I just lay there and bitch. <laughs> well, as long as y'all know that it, this ain't the show I'm shopping, so you know I, I don't care. No, but uh, I want to thank you guys for doing the show. I want to thank you guys for talking because honestly, I wasn't going to do it, especially Fig. I, I Fig, no, I, I was like, I ain't doing this. I, I'm not. So thank you for that. Thank you for doing that. And man, my sincerest condolences to Julie, his girls, you know, his parents, his, you know, his his closest friends and family and everything else. I, I, uh, uh, if you're offended that we did do the show, I apologize. But I think that he would have wanted us to to at least acknowledge and continue to do on and give acknowledgement to him. And Dave's getting his flowers right now. I just wish Dave was alive to see how many people so-called loved him that didn't love him when he was alive like that. So, but you know, it is what it is. Um, thank you all for watching this show. Tomorrow we're gonna get back to what we normally do. Um, and I guess that's it. I'll, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Thanks. Peace, baby. Peace. Sticky buttons. <laughs> <laughs>